ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> wonderful podcast listeners, the sounds <laughs> of those engines revving can only mean one thing. It is yet again time for the Henry and Heidi podcast. And off they go. They're off and running. <laughs> and there's Heidi leading Henry in the straight. And they're going into the first turn. It's Heidi May by a nose. Heidi May, Heidi May. Henry's taking the inside. He's <laughs> no, going around into the no. straight. And he's breaking into a lead. And oh no, he's got a flat tire. <laughs> balloon to the side, Heidi May. And off she roars. <laughs> And there's Henry on the side of the road, <laughs> watching her going away. Crying. Saying, I knew this day would come <laughs> when she left me. <laughs> and now I can finally get some work done. Oh, brother. Ah, well, Heidi Mae, how are you, buddy? I'm good. You are very, uh, you, you've been very frustrated today. <laughs> well. Yeah. 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 Oh, I, Rawlings frustrates the Heidi, I think. Because <laughs> Rawlings acts like a petulant child yeah. sometimes. And uh, gets Ra- Rawlings is impatient. And gets Manson eyes like, like, uh, if he doesn't get exactly what he wants. Rawlings wants the future now. Which doesn't even exist. Uh, Rawlings <laughs> wants the internet to do what it wants he, Too him bad. to do. Too bad. I I can't. I don't like to wait. Yes, but you don't have to act like a turd because oh, okay, things don't go your way. Okay, so Heidi Mae. I'm going uh, bald. <laughs> what What would you like to talk about today? Well, today I was thinking we would talk about get in the van. Get in the van. Wow. Get okay. in the van. A uh, very ambitious book. Seriously ambitious. Yeah, so my question is, when did you have the idea that you wanted to publish that well the idea came a while after i started my little book company in 1983 because uh, 21361 publications the, yeah, the writing came from necessity in that uh the nature of independent touring at that time especially for bands of our type you're playing small bars and small venues and there's a lot of time to hang out in the afternoon you don't have the money to go anywhere no one's taking you anywhere there's no runner there's no grocery run there's no money to buy groceries and so you have a lot of time on your hands which is why a lot of bands would get into some really bad habits because they just got nothing to do and those were very eventful days and inspired by henry miller who just kind of seemed to write about his life you know he just like i woke up i did this and i mistakenly thought it was easy because he made it look easy because he was so good I bought one of those composition notebooks and I started writing down more than just the little poemy things I was writing, but journal entries. Like I heard this conversation at a bar. I, I heard a Coke deal go down at Soundcheck and it was interesting. And so I started documenting everything and the writing turned into like a refuge. Like you know, band life is tough. So you can always go to your journal and go, ah, I'm mad and, and just kind of complain. And I became a better writer. Well, I got the hang of writing by just writing in that in those journal books just every day. And that was the big lesson, was that writing takes a lot of time. Like it takes hours and hours to write like a few hundred words to make it have any meaning whatsoever. So Get in the Van was the product of me basically learning how to do literary pull-ups. Just really... Like, okay, I'm going to sit all damn afternoon writing about what happened last night and really trying to make words capture everything that I was feeling. And it was like writing lessons I was giving to myself. And the writing, the journal thing became quite a thing for me, like obsessive. I have to write in my journal. And eventually, uh, I showed all the writing to my pal, Joe Cole. And he said, this has got to come out. Get in the Van was his idea. And it started as a book that you have a copy of, really rare at this point. It's called Hallucinations of Grandeur. Mm-hmm. And, and uh, it's a play on the idea of delusions of grandeur. It was, about, it was more like acid, hallucinations of grandeur. And I took 
a lot of the writing, not all of it, but a lot of the get in the van writing, those journals. So I just started like typing them in uh, to a computer and I put them in a book with no pictures. And we did like one or 2000 of that book. And it immediately went out of print because I had never had enough money to reprint the book. Where were you selling it? Uh, at shows. Spoken and, word shows? Yeah, spoken word shows, band shows, and little bookstores around Los Angeles. I would do those consignment deals. You bring in five books, uh, and when they sell through, you go back and you get your 15 bucks. And I would do that with, uh, was that Skylight Books on Vermont? And I think Vagabond Books mm-hmm. in Westwood. Craig and Patty were always very kind to me. They stocked all my books. And I would just go in there with a, a shopping bag of books and go, okay, see you in the spring. And I'd go on tour and come back and the books would sell very well. And they would just give me my like 120 bucks. And so we got the idea to get far more ambitious with the hallucinations of Grandeur Book, which at the book company, we called it Hog, H-O-G. And so Hogg got a massive overhaul where thousands of words, like the rest of the 81 to 86 tour journal were typed. And that was me dragging those notebooks, no backup. If I lost the notebook, I would have lost the manuscript. Dragging those notebooks on tour with a Macintosh SE, (laughs) like that ridiculous thing. 50 pounds. In a soft bag with a shoulder strap. Like, and and I I would take it on planes. I would take it in the vans we were traveling in. It, it was ridiculous. And I would sit down at soundcheck and I would, uh, you know, take the thing out, plug in the keyboard and the mouse, and I would sit there and type that thing. And I'll never forget, I was like in some backstage, like in Munich or Hamburg, and I looked at the notebook and my fault bad typing skills. And I went, wow, a year from now, I'm still going to be working on this. And that's that was the one of the best lessons I ever got in writing was like this is this is an all-in effort. Like in a year, I'm still going to be writing. So you better dig in, stop getting frustrated, needing everything now, because this is the real thing. And in the early 90s, the manuscript was done. We started gathering photos. I had a lot. We had to call up photographers we knew, get permission, pay them. Uh, one of the most ambitious layout that the, our company had ever done because it's photos and flyers. It's a big deal. And computers being what they were in those times and our layout skills being somewhat primitive, it was a monster effort with the technology and our rudimentary skills. It was a, a combination of a lot of heavy lifting. And so finally, the book went off to Palace Press in, I think, Hong Kong because that's where books with photos got printed. And sometime in 1994, Joe, whose idea it was, was was passed away, sadly. He never got to see it. And I'll never forget, we got, I think, we made a run of 10,000. And they all, you know, we are the company. So they all arrived at the office. Pallets. On Hollywood Boulevard. Yeah. Okay. We're 10,000 really heavy books. And so we had them split dropped. We got some at the at the uh, office and we had the rest dropped at a storage area uh on uh bronson and santa monica that that storage area with all the orange doors i think it is so we sent out our mailing list and the word of mouth went out and we were getting like up to like a few hundred orders a day and so it was it became such a thing that we had to set up our mail order thing in the storage space. We brought down a table and we had to not only box up and send to 80 million mail order, but we did have some distribution. And so some boxes were going into maybe some like indie record distribution. Stan and Gary had something set up. It was really rudimentary distribution. And so there were so many books in Jiffy Packs that we had to, talk to our UPS guy to do it, to empty a truck and bring it down to the storage space and make a special pickup. I mean, it was that's, crazy. That's cool. It was really cool. But it took me, Gary, Stan, and a friend of Gary's, uh, Nathan, I think, who we just hired him on, an extra pair of hands, to box up the orders. And it was like bloody... For a couple of weeks, and the the first edition, 
flew out the door. And, but it, the, the process of putting the book together, it, it was a good learning curve for all of us because it made us see what was possible. You can do a really cool looking book, but it was a ton of phone calls. All, you know, every photographer who you can find, you have to find them. You can't print someone's photo and not. Of course not. Right. But we did a <laughs> lot. It's because some of them, you, there's no internet uh, that, that we, where you, you there's no, there's like whitepages.com, mm -hmm. but there's no Google, like no search engine. There's no Facebook. You can't just find someone. Well, we couldn't, and we tried. And Did so, they find you? Yeah. Over the years, someone, and almost every one of them was really friendly. Like, hey, man, I remember I gave you that photo in 1982, and my name is, you know, Chris Jensen. Can, do you mind putting my name in there? And then we would put the name in on the next print run and send them some books. Now, if we did that book in 2017 and didn't add names, lawsuit, 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 I mean, it would be Lawyer City. In those days, and not to put down punk rock, but we were very punk rock. Like, where'd you get this photo from? I forget. Where do you think it's from? 1984, because I the length of my hair. Where's the show from? I don't know. Should we use it? Yeah. Like, what do you, sue us? We're broke. <laughs> and so... Relative poverty gives you an incredible amount of courage. Like, what can they do? And so get in the van. It was one of the most profound uh, learning opportunities I've ever had as a, a pseudo writer. Because like, it, it was a long haul to bolt, try and bolt down 500 words a day for a hyperactive guy like me. And it really taught me sentence structure. So I learned some by reading good books, but when you have to write yourself, it's a whole, you, all your lessons fly out the window. And so that was a, it's more than just a book, really. When you got the first copy, because it was the first edition was hardback. Oh yeah, and beautiful too, with a yeah, dust cover. So cool. I mean, really nice. I have a few copies myself. Yeah. What, what were you feeling? We, I'll never forget it. We were in the front room of the of the old office on the on the uh, two thirteen side, right in front the front window. Yeah, and one of us opened the first box, which had those crazy belt mm -hmm. plastic things. So you had to snap them open, and we cracked open the box, and we all grabbed one, and we cracked them open and just looked at them, and everyone was just quiet for a minute because everyone in that office worked so hard on that book, and we probably several expletives were let out but you know it looked as good a good looking book it is i mean really good yeah, yeah and sturdy like a serious hardcover book of great weight and the photos look good and the writing looked good it looked like a book you buy in a real store and we did that and it, it outclassed any like, like cosmetically and, and layout wise compositionally it outclassed anything we had ever done put together i mean it was just a high point for the company and as far as releasing something where you go damn that that worked it it might be the coolest thing the company ever did as far as a single thing in your hand yeah probably as far as what it took to put together yeah and so it turned out as cool as we wanted and, and I, I there's a ritual the first copy of one of my books that i get my hand on that I, the first one in my hand, I send to Ian Mackay. Yep. And I've been doing that since forever. And I do it to this day. Mm -hmm. And I always dedicate it, first one out of the box, Henry. And we'll do that with the next book that comes out on this company. It'll The first one in my hand. Until the day you croak. There you go. And um, that's what I do. And that's what I did. And, and I sent it to Ian, who read it immediately. And he either wrote me or faxed me <laughs> something. <laughs> And he said, you did it, man. You did it. But it was Joe Cole who said, you got to document this stuff. And I think his quote's at the front of the book. How did you come up with the title? Um, since two, two things. There was the fact that the van was the mothership. If you're an independent band, the van, you get so much familiarity with the inside of this thing that, you know, you fight in it. You live in it, you eat in it, you have brief romantic encounters in it while the rest of the band... Ew. Yeah, no. well, well, a lot of independent music, there's a lot of ew in it. And so there's that. But all my life up to that point, what did I do almost every day? You get in the van. Because that's where life is. Because the next gig is how you're living. 
There was an ad that Black Flag did. I don't know if I ever told you this. There's an ad that Black Flag did. Black Flag used to do K-Rock ads. You can find some of those ads, not all of them, but many of them on the Everything Went Black record. And they're incredibly funny. Uh, Spot, Mugger, Merrill, all these people are in the ads. In one of the ads, this is like 1980, at the end of one of the ads, I think Greg Ginn says, Get in the van! You hear a door go, <laughs> And I said, that's it. And there's a great photo that Glenn Friedman took of Davo and someone else pushing one of our many broken vans. All of our, you know, we bought bad vehicles. They always broke. And there's a, a picture in the book of Davo and someone else like trying to get one of our faulty vehicles to kick over and start going. And that was how the book got its title. Okay, did, with that title... Did Greg ever say anything to you? Greg never said anything directly to me. Okay. But he has said that the book is full of lies. Right. But he didn't say anything about you no, he using didn't try, his No, he words. didn't try and sue me for saying get in the van. <laughs> and what, what anyone in Black Flag, you know, like, like Greg or whoever, you know, they, they should read it and see that they get nothing but tributes in that. Because those, like Greg and Chuck are easily some of the hardest working people I've ever been around. We might have some disagreements here and there. That's legend. That's, that's known. But as far as like application to the thing, those guys, uh, that's hardcore. Like the de- the dedication was beyond belief. And the book hopefully captures what those times were like and what it was like in that band. And just the, kind of the, the strenuous effort to get through some days and weeks of like, you know, bad tours, bad road, bad food, bad audiences, and inter-band relationships. And we were not always the best of friends and we didn't get along all that well. Where it wouldn't get hot, it would just be cold. Like, we're not talking now for like the next month and a half. But we'd go out and play every night. It would be great. I uh, think every young band should read it. A lot really? of young bands do. Yeah. It's it's a guidebook. And, and and chances are, hopefully, for a young band, it won't be as rough as that. I don't think it needs to be. And I, I think the times are different. Touring systems are far more efficient. You can not get lost anymore because you just look at your cell phone. I mean, we would get legendarily lost because you're playing in you know, Metairie, Louisiana, which is great. But you try and get there with no map. Where do you, where's the map? I don't know. We lost it. You know, we were just like maniacs. Uh, we would rent these rider trucks, with, which would just get punished by members of the audience. They didn't like the show. So they come out and like slash the tires or they kick in the sides or they tear off the side view mirrors. And I'll never forget at one point in 84, we had this one rider truck that was just like war torn by the end. <laughs> it, just, it was just hammered. Um, somehow... The, the driver's side view mirror, which is very important for a box truck. I mean, yes. you will die without of trying course. to take a lane. Okay. It got just mangled somehow. It was either gone or the glass was gone. Rather than get it fixed, I'd be up in the, in the front with Davo, who was driving our sound man. Davo would lean his ear out the window and grit his teeth when he took a lane. <laughs> and I never understood what he was doing until one day I said, Davo, when you take a lane and you're gritting your teeth, what are you doing? And he said, I lean my ear out the window. And if I hear metal on metal, I know we're in trouble. Oh my God. <laughs> and that's kind of the level of it's daily insanity we were Russian operating Russian roulette at. with a truck. Yes. And he would just, lean, he would take the, the lane really slowly, listening for a beep or grinding metal. <laughs> and, and, and a normal band would just go to U-Haul and go, hey, can we get yeah. a mirror? No, not us. So did anyone from Black Flag reach out about that book? Yeah, Kira, um, who's just an amazing human. I was really rough on Kira in that book because we were you know, inside the band. You know, It was never a happy story. I mean, we were just very intense people, you know, like four piranha in a box. It's not always going to end well, you know. And so we were tough on each other. And I lashed out at Kira in the journal, like in in those days. And I document it. And, you know, I I was very rough on her. 
And she contacted me years later and she said, you know, you were pretty tough on me in that book. And, and I love Kira. I would do anything for Kira. I mean, you know, and we, good for her for calling you. Uh, and uh, yeah, yeah, but, but, but I don't, I don't have any defense. There's no defense against bad behavior. All I can say is I meant every damn word of it when I wrote it. I was sincerely mad. And there, trust me, there's no innocent people in that band. But uh, why her and not some of the guys? Do you know what I mean? Like it, uh, It's just, I can't go into any real detail past what the book denotes. And we're all grown up now. But there was quite a rift. Okay. And so I documented some of it. But uh, Kira... You know, and I and I told her I said, you know, I, I'm I'm so sorry. I just printed that as it was because it it that book has very little editing. Mm -hmm. I mean, I just left it all in. Mm -hmm. You know, the the not so groovy parts. And that's one of the appeals of the book, but it, it it pains me to this day that I hurt Kira. Uh, we had our disagreements as humans will do in a band. But that being said, Kira was a a girl a woman in a band of hyper masculine men in a hyper masculine genre in a time where it's a, some stupid low intellect boys club. And she threw down so hard. She was in, in my opinion, the fiercest version of black flag, Bill, Kira, Greg, and me. That was the most stripped down, no body fat, angry animal on the Serengeti version. I mean, I couldn't even hang in it sometimes for you know, my knuckles getting broken on some moron's head. And Kira, never one day did she say, ow. She just hit so hard. She's awesome. She is awesome. Like, yeah. wow. Uh, I mean, I've never been in a band with anyone that strong. Think about it. And like, she's, she's a the mere only slip of a girl. And she, yeah. And she was in a raging band at its most raging, mm -hmm. intense time and she so handled it so when she called you how did that conversation resolve i just said i'm really sorry and i hope we're still friends and she forgave me she was like all right well you know you suck for that you know i go yeah you're right <laughs> yeah you're right and and you know i never really thought about it until now and she brought it to my attention and it, you know it is what it is uh but I, I'm damn sorry. But I, I well, I know how much you respect her. I, oh, I know. oh yeah, I know. Yeah, and, and we we talk every now and then. I, I uh, wrote her last year. I know you were very proud. Well, her her and her team they won an Oscar yep. for sound. I was in Australia last year doing press for mm -hmm. the tour, and the the press lady Stacy, she said, you know, your friend Kira won an Oscar, and I wrote her. I said, you won an Oscar. She says, well. The sound team I'm on, we so we cool. won an Oscar. I said, Kira. So cool. I, you emailed me. You were so happy. For yeah. Her. Oh no, I yeah. was I was jumping up and down about it. I I was so happy. I mean, come on. So did any amazing. of the guys reach out about the book or congratulate you or anything? No. No feedback. No, not none that I'm aware of. And I don't know if they've read it. So Greg Ginn, who I don't know if he's read it or not, he just said it's a bunch of lies. Okay. Kira said, you know that 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 part was not so pleasant to read. You're a turd. Yeah, you're a turd. And that's all I know about feedback. There may have been some, but sitting here right now, I can't remember. Okay, let's talk about the cover because honestly, mm. that photo is one of the greatest rock and roll photos, in my opinion, ever. Because yeah. what it says on the marquee and then the riot gear. It captures the whole thing. Yeah. captures the mood of those times. Mm -hmm. And you see those those cops, they look like an episode of Chips. They got that, you know, the <laughs> swagger and 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 their their riot gear is not as stylish as it is now. It looks all military. They were just those Daryl Gates era LAPD who are rolling up on this show. And and no there's no call for the cops at the Ramones Black Flag show. I think that was November seventeenth, nineteen eighty four. The cops weren't called for a disturbance. They're just rolling up to kind of see if they can get something started. They weren't called. They just arrived in riot gear. And after the show, we were all thrown out of the venue by the cops. We're like, well, wait a minute. We just finished playing. Get out. But we're, our gear is, I mean, this is a show. We have loadout. We have settlement. Get out. 
And we all got kind of hustled out of the venue after the Ramones played. And I'll never forget, I was walking across the parking lot, uh, me to the rider truck, and I was walking with Joey, Ramon. Joey and I were walking together, talking about whatever. And a girl, I'll never forget this, a soundbite in my head. A girl walked up to Joey, not me, to Joey. And she got in Joey's face and said, rock star, I don't want to know you. And maybe it's a lyric of some song. And I kind of went, whoa, because I'm used to getting yelled at. And finally, it's not about me getting yelled at. And the girl was in Joey's face. And I'll never forget, Joey didn't register it. And he, he didn't he didn't even show that he even heard it. <laughs> that, and that's how you handle that. Yeah. And he just we just kept walking. And I think they were in a van. And I was in the truck with a girl named Jill Heath, who's from Toronto. And she would help road manage Black Flag. And she's an amazing person. And she and I took the first shift driving. She drove. I did shotgun. And the next show was uh, San Francisco or something. Yeah. It's a cool cover. It's a great book. It's 213's bread and butter. Yeah, it sells all the time. And as David Lee Roth once said to me, he said, you know, I'm lucky. I've written a few of Beethoven's fifths and it keeps me fed. <laughs> you know, because, you, you know, he's sure. part of some, a big band. Sure. And that is a book I've written that's one of those things where I get letters about it all the time. Mm-hmm. I sign copies of it all over the world. Yeah. And uh, people write me, hey, can I send you my copy in the mail and you'll sign it and send it back? Please don't. Uh, <laughs> but I dig it. I, I, I understand the interest and I appreciate it. This is, we can't be throwing books back and forth in the mail. But so the, the thing that I really dig is so many bands write me and say, we have a copy of Get in the Van in our van and we don't leave tour without it in the van. It's just kind of, it goes on tour with us because it means you're on tour with us. And I... I love that because I never had any idea. It was just a book we did. We thought it'd be really cool. But that was 23 years ago we put the book out. And uh, one thing that some readers might not know is we, we keep putting it out. And as the years go on, if you look at later printings of the book, you'll see a list of names at the front. And those are people who are either mentioned in the book or were from those days who have passed away. And sometimes when we, re- we reprint the book, we have a, a, like up to two names to add. And those times were hectic. But the fallout, I mean, you just see that this kind of riot life that we were living, that it took a toll on a lot of the people. Like a lot of the people I knew when I came to L.A., they're dead. Not from old age. I mean, like, right. you know, like O.D., yeah, no. the right. really tough. Mm-hmm. And... Every once in a while, someone goes, hey, did you hear about? You're like, ah, and add Add it to the list. Yeah. And so. It's a bummer. Yeah. And that book captures um, that, you know? I mean, it's a a perfect encapsulation of them days. And I think the photos really bring it home. And my favorite aspects of the photos is not the band, the audience. Just like these older hairdos. And you see these normal people next to the punk rock people and everyone looking up going like, what? What the hell are they doing? It's like two different worlds colliding because Black Flag was very insular. We had our own world and we'd, we'd land our little ship and go meet humans every night at the show and didn't always go well. <laughs> <laughs> it's a great book. Yeah, I mean, it's it's different than other books I've written. It's innocent in a way because I never wrote the, in the journal thinking that this Anyone is going to be... Anyone was going to read it. Right. Right. And now I do write knowing mm-hmm. it's going to come out. I don't know if anyone's going to read it, but I know that we're putting that book out. And as much as I try to forget that when I write, it's always with me that, okay. And I don't censor myself, but I probably do. Uh, I, I probably go, oh, well, mm, can't say that. But back then, you weren't even aware of that. Exactly. And that book is absolutely feral. And that's why. you like. That's a good word. That's what it is. Yeah, yeah. It, it's unconscious of itself. And you were feral. Oh, absolutely. It's just like our surroundings. Because now, say if that man, if we said, hey, if you said, hey, Henry, get all your black flag journals and let, we're going to make a book. And we typed them all up and I read and I saw that stuff I'd written about Kira. I would pull all that stuff. Right. Just because I, this is, it, 
it just, it's not cool. And I got no problem with her, quite the opposite. But those days, even up into the early 90s, when we published it, we just let it rip. And that's a good idea, I think, ultimately, to just let all the, the good and the bad come out, the parts you have to apologize for. Um, and so I look at that early writing of mine and always check myself to make sure I do my best to keep it as real as possible. And that's not easy because now you, you are knowing there's an audience and I can't help but think that to a certain degree, it informs the writing slightly. Of course. Yeah. I don't see how it, it can't. Couldn't. It can't not. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Does it bother you that that's the book? No, that... not at all. Okay. No, I'm just amazed that anyone cares at all. No, I... It is the same with a lot of people. Like, we don't need to name any band, but some band has been around a long time. Man, their first two records are great. Yeah, the rest of the records, yeah, but you know, it's all about the first two records. And, and that's the same for so many bands that you know and love. I mean, it, it it's just that kind of that initial shot. And I sold a lot of records with the Rollins Band. Like, like a lot of them. Played more shows and sold a lot of records than I ever did with Black Flag. But when someone comes up and says, hey, man, you're the guy from, they never go, hey, you're the guy from the Rollins. It's like, black flag, right? And so at a certain point, I know that's not the only thing I did. Right. But you have to be okay with other people just hanging on to that I think part. so. Like if you're Ozzy Osbourne, a lot of people say, hey, I like the Blizzard of Oz record. I mean, why not? It's a good record. But I think a lot of people are going to come up and say, you're black. You're the Black Sabbath guy. I mean, you, there's some things that, you, that you're, you can be part of in your life that are pretty big. And I was lucky to be in this band. And you're always going to be answering questions. Uh, our, our good pal Iggy Pop, uh, he said recently in an interview, because the Gimme Danger documentary on the Stooges just came out, or his you know storytelling and everything, and he said, look, people still want to know about this band, and I'm still going to tell them, because they're still asking. Like our good friend Ian Mackay, that guy's going to get minor threat questions for the rest of his life, like obsessive, like on June 15th, what did you have for breakfast before you went and did the vocal for? It is what it is. And he certainly has made a ton of music since, but there's but some people are prickly about it yeah and and when i first started working with you i felt like you were a little prickly about totally. it totally and and I, I i had to make room yeah i had to go i've into noticed it. through the years you've you're like cool with it yeah cuz i understand the enthusiasm and i i don't i don't like getting angry at a young person. I don't like being impatient with a young person. So when some like 17 year old like, man, black flag, man, what was that like? I'm like, okay. And I, I, I will answer the question because I can't go, oh, kid, you bother me. He wants to know how bad is that that someone wants to know about some music it's you made? It's not. It's really not the worst thing that ever <laughs> happened. And There's people who would wish they had that. Right. So, yeah, exactly. And so the thing you need to do is take every opportunity you can to be grateful. And that's the thing. Not always easy to remember when, you know, it's six in the morning at an airport and some guy's in your face to get a photo with his cell phone. You're like, really? I, I, I don't even, I think I'm still in a hotel bed sleeping. We had a little incident today where I ran into 7-Eleven and I came out to an angry Henry. Yes. <laughs> because someone wanted a photo. Because I was looking... <laughs> In another store, thinking <laughs> Heidi went in there, and I just want to, okay, she's not in there, I need to leave, and I want to leave, but I can't leave, because there's a guy between me and the doorway saying, can we do a photo? I want, yeah, and we did it, and he said, I know you get this a lot. I go, yeah, sometimes. He goes, do you mind? I said, no. I knew something and, happened. And because... we did the photo in front of the frozen drink section, Yes. and um, we got it done. We both smiled. Yes, and then I came out of 7-Eleven, and I looked across the street, and I saw your angry head, and I went, hmm, something happened. Well, I was more frustrated with where did Heidi go? I I'm standing you. in a parking lot, and I'm actually calling you on the cell phone, going, where are you? And, and I go, said, I'm in the step the Nippy! I don't sound like that. I feel a little bit. I was in 7-Eleven because I wanted grapefruit Perrier. <sighs> oh, that's the inside <laughs> of my head right now. <laughs> And so, 
I this don't... can only mean what? <laughs> Anything you'd like to say? I don't. I we may have done this headline before. A repeat, but it, fine. it might be a repeat because it happened again. Okay. Okay. And so that sound you're hearing, podcast listener, <laughs> can only mean one thing. It is time for Heidi's headline. All right, Heidi May, what do you got for me? Here you go. The, so I read this side, and then you flip it over. Henry makes Heidi a cup of coffee and... Crazy Sharpie arrow. Like, I can't figure out how to (laughs) turn the card over. She's up for three weeks because he uses (laughs) 10 pounds of coffee per cup. It's true. Okay, let's go back to the... Uh, the coffee it's lesson so that Heidi gave to Henry a couple of years ago. She said, I was hanging out with some people over the weekend and he, the guy said, if you use more than two tablespoons of coffee to make a cup, you're wasting your coffee. And she threw that at me like she's like the boss of the walk, <laughs> like she's the queen of caffeine. Like She knows everything. And so every once in a while, Heidi wants a cup of coffee and I obediently... Mm-hmm. Uh, go into the office kitchen and I make her a pu- cup of coffee. She like here's the here's the Heidi brew. Take a glass, fill it to the brim with ice. Fill it with water. <laughs> when it's half an inch from the top, get it a, 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 an eyedropper and go. Boink, Only when boink, it's your coffee. Boink, boink, boink. Four drops of coffee. Uh, only when it... And the worst coffee. The worst possible grind. Stir it up and she go. Mmm, delicious. <laughs> I like diner coffee, Henry. Oh, you like coffee you, that it, it's the proverbial brown crayon Henry, stirred in hot water coffee. Your coffee that you made last week, it was the color of tar. It was that, it was thick. But, but what I options did I give water. you? I, I, I cut I, it with water. I give water. you an empty glass of ice and I go, here's your concentration, <laughs> concentrated cup and you make uh, and build it to the color you like. Yeah. And I left you to your own devices. Yes, but still, it... I can't explain it, but it's like an electric shock goes through my body and I can't sleep for weeks. I love that. No. You come into the no. office all cranky and yeah. weird. Yeah. I love that. <laughs> I love you like that. when I'm cranky. Yeah. No, I don't like oh, that. Oh, I, I jump upon it. No, that's not my nature. Yes, I know. I, I like to get no. you all bent out of shape. No. It's easy to get to you. <laughs> You're so mean. Like, why do you... Honestly, think about it. One Honey, time... You, you want the truth? Yeah. I'll give you the truth. Okay. I got no one else. <laughs> like, you're it. No. Yeah. Find someone else. No. Yes. No. No. Yeah. 20 years, buddy. No. No. <laughs> no, I want out. <laughs> I do. Oh, I do. I'll be showing up on your doorstep. No. Good morning. 20 no. years, Cheryl. Let's see. I'll no. be. I'll be 76. I'm not doing this. 70. No. Tw- mm-hmm. Heidi, we are basically no. at the halfway point. Nope. Oh, yeah. Nope. Oh, yeah. You're nope. going to get those long rubber gloves. Cute. Change it out, Rollins. <laughs> no way. I'm not changing your diapers. I'm not doing it. I draw the line. Oh, no yeah. way. No. Oh, no. Cue gonna the be, applause. It's going to be so Let's great. Let's do the outro. Oh. I'm telling you right now, it's not going to happen. Oh. I'll Ladies, get you a giant. Everyone's happy. Yay. You're going to have to have a giant bib. Oh. Yay! <laughs> we'll get you the nurse outfit. No. Some tongue depressors no. for the Gerber baby food. No. I want to write my next book <laughs> on on my feet. <laughs> yeah. Nope. Oh, I can't nope. wait. Nope. Wonderful podcast listener. Thank you so much for listening and enduring Heidi May. What? Yeah. And no. until we are back with you again, listen, listen twice. Listen well, but keep listening. Thank you. Don't do that. I told you it makes me sick. <laughs> At least you're not using the siren anymore so that poor guy doesn't think he's getting pulled over. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's not good. Oh, no. Oh. No, that was sad. Oh. <sighs>